FNAF World is a really cool game. About a year ago, I made a video going over one of the fastest FNAF World speedruns where the game can be beaten in under 14 minutes. But today, we're going to be going through the 100% speedrun of the game. Six endings, getting every single chip item in the game, as well as getting every animatronic in the update to Halloween area. Let's check it out. Alright, so time for the speedrun starts once we go through the opening menu, select our party, and then hit the done button here. Then as soon as we start chatting it up with Fredbear here, we'll actually want to reset the game, as just like in my previous speedrun video on this game, since loading times aren't counted for running this game, it's actually faster to restart the game to skip this than it is to sit through all of the dialogue with Fredbear. Sorry buddy, but we'll definitely be seeing you a lot more throughout this run. Anyways, as soon as we get control of Freddy in the overworld, first things first, we'll want to go unlock every animatronic that was added in Update 2 to this game. Oh, and yeah, should go without saying, but you'll want to run away as fast as you can from any of the random encounters that may pop up. Then, we gotta go up to this tree here, and then hold left for about 3 to 4 seconds, and this lets us start walking out of bounds. And then going down here will take us right to the creepy Halloween area that was added in Update 2. So here, we'll want to make our way up and over first to this portal near Nightmare in here, which takes us to a nice PC desktop where we can launch a Foxy EXE program. Gee, wonder what inspired that. Now this first minigame in this Halloween area has us controlling Bonnie left and right, while Foxy creepily appears and narrates in the background. Like dang, I can definitely see this giving kids some serious nightmares. Listen to my voice, and you will find the key. Anyways, the first room here has nothing for us to worry about, so we can just casually waltz over to the next area, where here, there's a chance that a withered Freddy will appear, and if he does, you basically just have to walk in the opposite direction until he fades away. So for this room, you'll want to stop moving for a fraction of a second every couple steps, as withered Freddy is programmed to only have a chance of appearing if you hold to the right for more than about three and a half seconds. So yeah, if you just briefly stop moving every couple seconds, there's no chance he'll spawn in, and this makes the rest of this room a breeze. Then for the third and final room, where the graphics get all sorts of messed up, here the shtick is that you have to hide in the waveform shadows in the background from oncoming graphics of, a uh, cat? Yeah. And if you didn't get jump scared up until this point yet, since you have three lives in this minigame, you can just walk through the cats later on in this room to save some time. And just like that, we can welcome our first new animatronic to the party, Nightmarian. Now next up is FNAF 57, Freddy in Space. And if you've watched my video on speedrunning the normal run of this game, you might remember that this minigame alone took up like a quarter of that video. And things aren't much different this go around, as this time, this minigame once again takes up a big chunk of this speedrun, and that's simply because we have to play through it not once, not twice, but three whole times. Yeah, you'll basically become an expert of Freddy in Space by the end of speedrunning this game even once. Anyways, to get it out of the way first, since it's the most difficult, we have to clear this minigame with the base weapon upgrade, so basically avoiding any and all of the cupcakes found throughout the level which upgrade Freddy's weapon. So yeah, we just gotta move and groove past all of the lasers, robots, blue goopy guys, tentacles, and floating molecule blob things, all while listening to series creator Scott Cawthon blab on about stuff. Now, although the enemies throughout this minigame aren't that big of a threat overall, their hits can quickly add up, especially if you're unlucky enough to not get a lot of hearts from destroying them along the way. So you'll kinda have to be a bit careful, as you'll want to try and keep around a minimum of 60 HP. And finally, after trekking along, we can get all the way up here to get the super jump upgrade, which we'll need to beat this minigame. Then after getting it, we have to backtrack. Yay. To this area where with our newly upgraded jump ability we can make it up to this ledge, after which we can do a few more jumps, and despite Scott telling us that this is definitely not where we need to go, this brings us to the final section of the game. Now here, just like I covered in my other speedrun video, I'll be saying that a lot in this video by the way, so if you haven't checked it out yet, definitely do so. If you simply just hold to the right here, at the cost of losing 30 HP, you can walk through this area quite easily and basically outpace how fast the screen moves with you, and doing so renders the flying laser things at the end section basically useless in stopping you. But since you do need to take three hits from these Metal Man robots, like I said earlier, you should probably aim to get into this final area with at least like 60 HP left. 
Then, once the game finally catches up to us running to the right so fast, we get to square up against the head of none other than Mr. Cawthon. And here, there's a really nifty trick where if you simply just stand around this spot and crouch, most of Scott's attacks will miss you and basically only the laser blaster on the ceiling can ever hit you. And thankfully, since it only does 3 damage at a time, so long as you have enough health to last you by absolutely mashing the fuck out of the X key to blast away at Scott here, the fight will be over in, well, I was gonna say no time, but honestly, mashing away with the weakest blaster here can sometimes feel like it takes an eternity. And bada bing bada boom, Scotty is down for the count and beating him with the weakest blaster nets us. Coffee? Okay. Then for the second go around of running through this minigame, we can get anywhere between 1 and 8 upgrades to our blaster, but to save some time you should only really be getting the ones that are quick to get, like the ones near the start, or the ones that are on the way where you normally have to go anyway, like in this hidden room on the way up to getting the jump upgrade. And now with the upgraded blaster, we basically just do the same thing all over again, but this time things go a bit faster with the added damage output. And then, after completing this run, we get Jacobani, which if you saw my other FNAF World speedrun video, was an absolute MVP of the team there, and trust me, he'll be just as useful for us this time around too. Now for the final run through of FNAF 57 here, we'll actually need to find all 9 cupcake upgrades throughout the level. In addition to the one near the start, there's one hidden in this wall here. Then going left here, we can clear out the robots in this room to find the next one. In the underwater bubbly area, we can continue to the right here, and after defeating these blue blob fellas, there's the fourth. There's, again, the one going up to the jump upgrade I mentioned earlier. The sixth one can be obtained after getting the hyper jump, and then continuing to the left here and getting through a whole whack load of enemies, which at this point with all the upgrades so far, aren't all that much of a threat anymore. And I hope you're more of a fan of backtracking than I am, as the seventh and probably most annoying of the cupcakes requires us to go all the way back to the start of this minigame, where now with the hyper jump we can make it up to this ledge to find the cupcake there. Then the 8th cupcake can be found by making a high jump to the left into this wall near the end segment. And then finally the ninth and last cupcake is found hidden in the top of the left wall here in the final area. And now with all 9 upgrades at our disposal, our blaster is an absolute beast and basically anything on screen can be wiped out with ease. And having all these upgrades is really nice too, since each one increases fire rate, so I didn't have to mash at all now, and my fingers could get some much needed rest. Then, as you'd probably expect, the third and final fight against Scott with the fully upgraded blaster is a breeze, and we got our next unlock, Purple Guy himself. I guess he really does always come back. And now that we've done all that there is for FNAF 57, we can finally move on to the next minigame we gotta do here, Foxy Fighters, the shmup that's totally not a reference to another game featuring a fox. For the most part, this minigame is pretty simple. I like to just sit in the top left of the screen here and get the long laser beam attack as I believe it has the highest damage rate. There's also a really nifty little trick for this minigame, as if you press the Ctrl and S keys, you can actually mute the game, and similar to what we saw for speedrunning FNAF Security Breach, this actually lets you skip over most of the dialogue in this minigame, which can shave off roughly a minute per playthrough, and of course, you also get to skip this part, which is an added bonus. You won't get tired of my voice, will you? You won't get tired of my voice, will you? You won't get tired of my voice, will you? You won't get tired of my voice, will you? You won't get tired of my voice, will you? The catch is though, you need to unmute the game when Foxy mentions that the squad is going to take back what's theirs, as if you don't, the minigame won't progress properly and essentially softlocks. Anyways, eventually we make it to the final boss, Soul Dozer here, and this is pretty much the hardest part of this minigame, as in addition to more enemies spawning in, you'll shoot some spreading projectiles as well as some missiles which can often be tricky to avoid. Well, the fight still isn't anything that difficult, as each hit only does a little bit of damage, but I didn't mention it yet, but much like Freddy in Space, we'll actually need to play through this minigame twice, and the more difficult unlock challenge here requires us to beat this minigame with an A rank. Well, how do you get an A rank, I can already hear you asking. Basically, you want to defeat as many enemies as you can, and take as little damage as possible. You don't have to go through the whole thing without taking any damage, but I think you're only allowed like 3 hits or so before your rank drops to a B. 
So if all goes well, you'll put Soul Dozer in the dirt, get that sweet, sweet A rank, and subsequently unlock the oh-so-creepy-looking Nightmare Balloon Boy himself. Now typically you'll want to try and do that one first since it's more difficult to get it out of the way, but I messed up here and got a B rank first, and if you do this, you'll come out of this minigame with Jacko Chica unlocked. And then last but not least, we have to squeeze through the side of the house here to make our way to the final minigame we have to do in this area, Chica's Magic Rainbow, which is a pretty tough side-scrolling minigame where you have to guide Chica through an onslaught of obstacles. Like seriously, everything here wants to kill you. The flowers, flying logs, heck, even these butterflies are out to get ya. And while you're trying to get through all of this, you'll have the magic rainbow being annoying as hell every time you die. You'll get it eventually. Is this your first time to play a video game? Keep up the good work, sport! Oh, it's so cute when kids try to play games! Anyways, the first two sections of this minigame have us dodging the flower petals, and honestly, it looks more difficult than it is, as once you know where to jump, it's not that bad, except for this last part which is still quite precise. Then next, we have to avoid the death ray that the rainbow will start shooting at us, as well as another sneaky plant shot. Then we have to dodge the beams from all of the killer butterflies here, as well as from the rainbow again. Then we have to hop over some hidden wooden spikes, deal with more lasers and more wooden spikes. Then we have to quickly jump over not one, not two, but three sets of floating logs. And then for the last section here, the rainbow will now start shooting out some eyeballs at us that will try to home in on Chica, so all while dodging more wooden spikes, you also have to jump around to distract the eyes into heading a different direction, and then finally we can reach the end. And beating this minigame gets us the self-insert of Scott Cawthon himself, or as he's also known as, Anim Dude. And then, guess what? Much like the other minigames, we have to play through Chica's Magic Rainbow again, and with the second goal being to complete the entire minigame in under three minutes. It may not sound all that tough, but trust me, this one can be pretty challenging, especially since you don't really have unlimited lives here, as after dying too much, the rainbow will lose patience and will straight up just end you. I'm gonna kill you! You still suck! But at the end of it, if you do manage to beat this minigame in under three minutes, you will unlock Mr. Chipper, a character from one of the games Scott Cawthon made before FNAF, Chipper and Sons Lumber Co. Whew, sure I'm glad that's done. Sure would suck if we had to deal with Chica's Magic Rainbow again. And with all of those minigames done, it's finally time to get on with the rest of the game, and we'll also want to reorganize our party now to first start with Nightmarian, Anim Dude, as well as Jack Hobani and Chica. If you thought having Jack Obani as one MVP in the other speedrun I covered was cracked, having four of these absolute units gives us exponentially more power. Now I'm sure the question will get brought up as to why the Halloween animatronics are required for the 100% speedrun and not any of the others that are found in the game. And well, not only are they incredibly useful for their damage output, as well as Jack Obani and Purple Guy having the slash remove which can deal a whopping 99,999 damage to an enemy, but basically it all boils down to RNG. Since the characters here are guaranteed to be unlocked via certain criteria in the minigames, they're necessary for the run. And since encountering the rest of the characters is entirely left to chance, they aren't required for this category, as it basically just results in having to farm encounters, often for hours on end. At least that's my take on why that is. I asked the speedrun community and they couldn't really give me a good answer, but yeah, I think that just makes the most sense. Well, that's not 100% then. Hey, listen, I don't make the rules, okay? There is a separate speedrun category called 157%, or sometimes referred to as true 100%, and if enough of you are interested, maybe I'll make a stream of it here sometime or something. Let's just say there's probably a reason why only like five people have ever submitted a run in that category so far. Anyways, let's get back on track here. First, we'll want to start working towards the clock ending, and to do that, we have to start interacting with Fredbear in the overworld. For those that don't know, after chatting with the fella for a bit, if you leave the game on the last message of the interaction and don't press the done button for about 13 seconds, the game will seem to glitch out and Fredbear will transform into a fourth wall breaking pixel version of himself, and in those dialogue bits, as soon as the message with the word clock in it appears, the respective clock will then appear in the overworld. So basically as soon as you see the text box with the word clock, you're good to reset the game to save some time. 
Also, another quick pro tip while we're talking about resetting again, if you hold the enter key after doing so, you'll actually progress through the intro warning disclaimer much faster. It saves a few seconds at a time, but since you end up resetting numerous times throughout one of these runs, the time saves can definitely add up. Then once back in the overworld at Fazbear Hills, we can head to the right and oh would you look at that, it's our first clock. Touching this takes us to the first clock minigame, or micro game I guess, as basically all you need to do here is touch the pixel balloon boy here to move him into the box. Yeah, that's it. Then with that one done and back at the start of Fazbear Hills, we can now go to the left and notice that one of the trees is glitching here and going into it takes us to our first trip through the glitchy subworld known simply as Flipside. Once again, if you've seen my previous video, you'll be no stranger to these, but if you didn't, these mostly act as a sort of shortcut between areas of the game. In here, we'll want to skip over the first orange portal that takes us back to the regular world, and then head down here to the next one which will bring us to Choppy's Woods, where we can flip this yellow switch to unlock the ability to fast travel here in the future. And right beside us here is the next Fredbear that we want to chat with, and once again, after waiting, we can get the next secret bit of text that will spawn the second clock, this time in Dusting Fields. So after we make our way to the left to get to Dusting Fields, we can find the first chip in this treasure chest up here, and then head on up to the second clock near Lulbit. And this clock micro game is another cakewalk, as the correct order to flipping the panels here can be achieved by straight up just moving to the right. Yeah, crazy gameplay. And now we rinse and repeat this process for the next Fredbear here, where the glitchy version now spawns in the next clock in the mine. But before we get there, we actually have to do our first real battle of the run, as up until now you should be skipping all of the random encounters, and here we face up against Bouncer, the Gatling Gun Armed Snowman. Now fortunately, or unfortunately, depending on how you look at this, this fight is an absolute breeze, as most of the moves of our party will one-shot this battle with ease. And after that's done, before we head on to the next cave to find the third clock, we'll actually first want to start grabbing a few more chips, some of which can be incredibly useful for the rest of the run. The first one will require us to touch the glitchy rock here to go through another subworld, but this time we go subworldception, as by finding a glitchy blue tree in the subworld, this takes us to a sub subworld, where the graphics get even more basic and movement gets even slower. Thankfully, our time in Subworld Level 2 is pretty short this time, and after getting back to the Overworld, we can hit another switch to unlock another fast travel point, as well as walk through this tree to get one of the most important chips in the game, Run Luck, which increases the chance that you'll be able to run from a wild encounter, which is extremely useful for saving time in this speedrun. And then, after equipping that chip, near this one we can actually find another one hiding behind this log, Head Start Speed. Then the next pair of chips, Head Start Strength and Head Start Defense, will need us to warp back to the starting area as they're found just to the northeast here. Now both of these are actually guarded by an Auto Chipper mini boss, who is thankfully once again really easy to defeat with our squad of absolute legends. But after that's done, we can grab both chips which are equally thankfully really close to each other here. We next want to enter the Mysterious Mine, but instead through the entrance found in Choppy Woods, and after navigating inside for a while, we can find an Eyesore mini-boss which is guarding the next chip we need, Endless Speed. And after that's obtained, we quickly warp back to Choppy's Woods to fight yet another auto-chipper to the left here who is guarding the Evercomet weak chip, and then finally, at least for now, going back to the top area of Dusting Fields, by walking up into this rock for a bit, we can actually get taken to the glitched out version of the overworld map, known as, uh, this. Yeah, this game sure does have a lot of secrets. And in this state, you can actually walk through almost everything in the game, and we can use this to waltz over to the right here to grab the block unscrew chip, which is otherwise blocked off by a bunch of obstacles. And with those chips in the bag, we can get back to finding the next clock, so onwards we go back into the mine entrance here in Dusting Fields, and simply going up and then to the left here, we can find clock number 3, where the micro game doesn't get any more brain straining, as here, literally all you need to do is walk straight to the left to place the cupcakes into their respective box. Now still in the mine, we'll want to go snooping around here for two more chips which are once again guarded by the eyesore mini-bosses, and defeating both gets us the auto gift boxes chip as well as Evercomet Strong. Now next, just like we did in the normal mode speedrun of this game, we'll want to return to Choppy's Woods again and walk up against the stump here which will once again bring us to the glitchy version of the overworld, where we can encounter some more epic glitchy enemies like bunch of greater than symbols. Yeah. 
And in this state, we can walk northeast for a while, through the woods and across the water, to grab the auto shield chip tucked between these toadstools. And this is another chip that's incredibly useful for this run. And now that we have all the chips that we'll want to use for the rest of the speedrun, we can go ahead and equip them now. So in addition to run luck, we'll want to slap on endless speed to obviously increase the speed of our party, auto shield, which, as it implies, will automatically generate a shield in battle to help protect the party, and then finally auto gift boxes which will give each party member an extra life, and it should be pretty self-explanatory as to why that's super useful. Now with those equipped, we can use Warp 4 to finally initiate the next chat with Fredbear to fittingly get the ball rolling for clock number 4. Then after another reset, we get Freddy to hop into a boat and head north in the water. Now here, there is a random chance that if you're unlucky enough, you'll have to go through an unskippable encounter against the Seagoon Squid mid-boss. It's not as tough as the Super Goon boss that we encountered in the normal mode run of this game, so it sucks to get this fight pop up, but it's not a run breaker. Anyways, after looping back into Choppy's Woods here, we can sneak behind this windmill to get to yet another entrance into the mine area, where after some more dungeon crawling, we can find the next clock, and for once here, it's at least a little more interesting than moving in a single direction. Well, you do still just move to the left, but you actually want to stop on the second square in the middle here, which will show the number 395248 and you'll have to stay on this number until the timer runs out, which is honestly pretty cryptic. And for those that don't know, this number is actually a reference to Five Nights at Freddy's 3, where this is the same code that you punch into the secret wall tile keypad on Night 4 to play the hidden Stage 1 minigame there. And now with that clock done, we can take Warp 4 again, and then loop back up here to this glitchy tree to once again enter the subworld. And here we can make our way to the sub-subworld again, and taking this route will actually take us to finally some new scenery, as we get our first taste of Black Tomb Yard, where we can hit this switch to unlock another fast travel point for us to use later on. We can then sail north, through the maze of toadstools, where we can, big surprise, find yet another secret path back down, where we can walk through some trees to find a path that leads us to this tombstone, which will teleport us to the deep metal mine. And here, we need to get yet another chip, but this time it's not guarded by an eyesore, but rather a mad endo, who is slightly more challenging, as it'll usually survive more than one hit, but it's still no match compared to our team. And after mad endo is down, we can grab the Freddle Fury chip, warp back to the tomb yard, where we can hit up Fredbear again. But this time, we actually do want to just end the dialogue here, and after this is done, we can grab the block jump scare chip down here, and then after walking up into this tombstone for a bit, you know the drill, it's off to the wonderful land of and star underscore underscore T-W-R-E, we go, and this time we can walk to the left here, bypassing Pinwheel Circus all the way back to the mine area, where we can grab the otherwise unobtainable auto mimic chip we saw on our first visit there up on these boards. Then back at Black Tomb Yard, we can make our way through the maze to get to this entrance into Deep Metal Mine, where just like our previous visit there, we have to again do some maze work to fight yet another Mad Endo, who this time is guarding the next ship, Find Characters. Then also in this mine, we can find another glitchy tombstone, and yep, we gotta do some more subworld schmooving, but this time in the sub-subworld, we can find another glitchy tree, which will take us to the sub-sub-subworld, or let's just call it Subworld 3 for short, and yeah, things get even more basic with our Minecraft creeper looking Freddy, and movements get even slower too, like it's honestly quite painful how slow you move around here. But eventually, after slowly slugging along, we can find portals back up where each step feels so much faster than the previous one, and finally we can make our way to Pinwheel Circus, where flipping the switch here unlocks the sixth and final fast travel point. We don't spend much time here yet though, as we can head south to be taken back to Choppy's Woods, where another secret path can be found through these trees and toadstools, which leads us to another Mad Endo and yet another chip. Now warping back to Pinwheel Circus, we have to head north all the way up to this green tent here, where we can walk up for a bit to be taken to Deep Metal Mine once again, and you probably won't believe this, but we have to crawl through this mine to find yet another Endo guarding yet another chip. Crazy. Then, after rinsing and repeating our trek through Pinwheel Circus, we can head even further up this time to have a chat with Fredbear, where we wait around for the fifth and final glitch interaction to spawn in the last clock that we need. 
So after once again restarting the game, we can square up against Browboy here, who is another pushover for us to get through. And after that's done, we can grab the auto regen ship up here, and then we can enter this green tent to be taken to the messed up areas of Pinwheel Circus, where each door we go through applies a different wacky effect for the game. And after going through these two purple tents, we can hit the clock here for another super easy micro game that just has us pushing another graphic into a box, and this time apparently this is supposed to be Shadow Bonnie or this, and yeah, that's really it. Now before we go ahead and close out the clock ending, since we're already in this area, we'll want to go through some more of the Pinwheel Funhouse Maze to eventually make our way over to Bubba here, the creepy wind-up Freddy looking mini boss. Now this will be the most difficult boss fight so far, as Bubba here isn't just a one or two shot kill, but I suppose that's still not saying too much, as it's only about like five attacks now, which is still pretty easy. Once that fight is done, we can go through some more of the Pinwheel Circus to make our way to this chest containing the Counter Bite Chip, and then finally we can walk through this secret wall that takes us out of the circus and into Black Tomb Yard, where we can find another Fredbear. This time we'll want to skip through him to save some time, and just like we did in the normal speedrun, by going to either the Party Chips or Bites menu found on screen, and then exiting back into the game, for a short time after you load back in, you can actually walk right through Fredbear without triggering the dialogue bit with him. And since we already spawned all the clocks and no longer need to chat with him, this can save a whole bunch of seconds. Anyways, the glitchy rock behind Fredbear here takes us back to the subworld, then we go to subworld 2, then back to subworld 3. And this time around, by going to the right, we can go down here to find another secret path which takes us to another glitchy tree, and well, as you'd probably expect, this actually takes us to Subworld 4, also known as the fourth glitch, where we can find a man fishing named Old Man Consequences, where apparently, by getting here we've gone too far down into the game's code, and we're stuck here to fish forever, or alternatively, there's another ending here where you can actually drown in the lake, but anyways, this actually nets us our first ending of the run. Yay, only like five more to go. Now after reloading back into the game, we'll actually want to re-enter the same subworld path we just took, but instead of going into the glitchy tree in subworld 3, we'll head upwards to start finding portals back to the overworld, and this takes us to the next boss fight against Pork Patch, who's honestly just about as challenging as Bubba was earlier. And again, after about 5 hits, defeating Pork Patch here nets us the key item, which allows us to open all of the locks found all over the overworld. So with it, first we can go and finally complete the clock ending, as we can take warp number 4, loop up and around again to find this lock leading to this portal thing, and touching it takes us to the clock ending, where we can see some unknown character tell us that they are still our friends, and that the pieces are in place for us. Now I'm not much of a FNAF lore guy myself, but I'm sure that has some significance, right? And now with two endings done, we want to start working towards the regular ending of the game, which is the same one that we did in my video on the normal run. So just like there, we have to start flipping four switches found around the overworld to unlock the four barriers blocking our way to the final boss that we saw foreshadowed in Pinwheel Circus. So it's off to Fazbear Hills we go to find this first locked switch up here, thankfully not guarded by anyone. Then the second switch can be found in the south part of Dusting Fields, this time guarded by Snow Cone, basically a beefier version of Bouncer from before. Then the next switch is found in Lily Gear Lake, where we can boat our way to the right up here to find it being this time guarded by Super Goon. And then after Super Goon is down, finally the last switch is found in Deep Metal Mine, so it's back to Black Tomb Yard we go, and then once in the mine from there, we can find the switch guarded by Overclock, who is basically just a stronger version of the Mad Endos. Then after this, although we got all four switches pressed, we'll actually want to head back into Deep Metal Mine via the entrance behind the windmill in Choppy's Woods again. And this is because we can bang out another rather quick ending here, as by making our way over to this spot, where the spotlight around Freddy stops following him, we can like walk out of bounds and head north to not only find the Endless Strength Chip, but also the Endless Defense Chip, which is guarded by the final eyesore we'll need to see the speedrun, and this is actually the last chip that we'll need to grab, so yay, we can stop having to look around for these two. Anyways, after that fight against Eyesore is done, we'll actually want to shake up our starting party and swap out Nightmarian and Jacko Chica for Purple Guy and Coffee, as we'll want Coffee for his Neon Wall 2 move that will give our entire team invincibility for 5 seconds at a time, and we'll want Purple Guy for his Slasher move so we can double our chances of it hitting in a fight. 
So with our new squad back in the section where Freddy can go off screen in the left here, in this spot, if you start going more to the left, you can actually encounter a secret boss, Chipper's Revenge, a large metallic version of Chipper. Now this is by far the most difficult boss fight of the run so far, as he has a whopping 200,000 HP. And this is leagues higher than the 20 to 30,000 HP we've seen with the previous few boss fights. Thankfully though, things here are pretty straightforward. We'll want to slap the Neon Wall 2 whenever we can, get Anim Dude to do the Mega Virus attack to deal passive damage over time, and then we basically just have to keep spamming the slasher move from Jack Obani and Purple Guy and pray to the RNG gods that the attack will hit. For those unaware, yeah, although this attack can deal 99,999 damage, there's only a 10% chance that it will hit, so yeah, we're basically at the mercy of chance here. But if all goes well with timing the neon walls, and you manage to land at least one slasher hit, Polished Chipper here will be down for the count, and we got our third ending in the bag. And now, since we already did all of the groundwork for the normal ending, we can go right up to the normal final boss of the game, simply called Security. And honestly, I find this fight is a breeze compared to Chipper's Revenge, as even on hard mode difficulty, Security here has half the health at only 100,000 HP. That said though, we still really want those slasher attacks to land to make quick work of this fight, but yeah, compared to the last one, this one I find is much easier to get through. Thankfully on my best run, I actually got the slasher to land first try, which is pretty nuts. And beating security here technically gets us the normal mode ending, but unlike beating this boss on normal difficulty, which will get you the text ending basically mocking you for not beating it on hard mode, this time we get to move beyond security and get to this glitchy blue thing here, which turns out to be none other than the game's creator, Scott Cawthon himself who applauds you for getting this far in hard mode, but also reveals himself to be the Puppet Master before starting up a battle against you. Now honestly, despite all of the build-up, I don't find that this battle is any more difficult compared to Chipper's Revenge from before, I guess besides his fourth wall move, which can basically wipe out your entire party in one hit. But our squad is just that powerful, at least when the slashers actually hit that is. I've had a few runs where I just got incredibly bad luck here with the slashers, that this fight would end up taking like 20 minutes or more. Oh yeah, it's also pretty funny to battle Anim Dude with Anim Dude also in our party. But there's not much else to say about this fight that I didn't with Security or Chipper's Revenge, so after the stars align and you land a slasher or two to quickly end the battle, with Security and Scott defeated here, that's endings 4 and 5 out of 6 complete. And now for the final stretch of this run, for the 5th and last ending that we need, it's off to the Halloween update area we go again. And after swapping out coffee to get Nightmarian back in the party, we can go past this Fredbear where we can enter a portal to the final area of the game, Geist Lair. Now the gimmick of Geist Lair is that whenever you get into any encounters here, your entire party will rapidly start to lose health. And that's why we swapped Nightmarian back into our party, as his bubble breath move is basically specifically meant for this area, as using it will briefly protect your party from rapidly losing health here. Anyways, there's not really much else we need to do here besides navigate, so after skipping random encounters against Neons, Jangles, and flipping Pea Goons, we can eventually make our way to the true boss of the game, Purple Geist. Ha, just kidding, the final boss is actually Chica's Magic Rainbow? Great. Now this is by far the most difficult boss in the game, as the lovely Rainbow has a colossal 500,000 HP. Yup, half a million. And to make matters even worse, you have a time limit in this fight too, as after 3 minutes pass, Chica's Magic Rainbow will do a Rainbow Overload attack that will instantly kill you and result in a game over, where loading back into the game will take you back to the starting area. Prepare for Rainbow Overload! <laughs> yeah, this, you definitely don't want this. So if the slashers aren't landing or things just aren't going your way in the time limit, be sure to reset the game before it runs out, as this way you can just get back into the battle a lot faster. And big surprise, the slasher strategy remains here once again. You'll want to get Anim Dude's Megavirus attack going for passive damage, as well as spam his fourth wall move. Nightmarian will also need to get the fourth walls going, as well as stay on bubble breath duty whenever the protection starts to wear off. 
And of course, our other two legends will just need to keep spamming Slasher, at least until three or four of them will hit, otherwise time will run out, and yeah. But if the stars align and the slashers slash, Chica's magic rainbow is off to pound sand, and honestly, I don't think I could stand any more of her this run. And that, my friends, is the sixth and final ending we needed, so that is time for this speedrun. Now, I only got about an hour and 18 minutes for my best speedrun, which honestly, I can't complain too much since I'm still a big noob at this game. But as of the making of this video, the current world record is held by the Lone Banana Zero, who on December 13th, 2022, beat the then world record by only about a minute with a time of just under 55 minutes. Anyways, it was really fun to revisit speedrunning FNAF World again and go through more of it to find most of the endings. The only ending that's missing here is the Universe End ending, which similar to what I discussed earlier, is I guess excluded from this category due to having to actually find, battle, and recruit Fredbear to your party. But like I said, maybe someday I'll revisit this awesome game again for the 157% or true 100% run. Until then though, I hope you enjoyed this video, and you're extra epic if you've made it all the way to the end here. While you're here, check out some of my other speedrun videos, and be sure to subscribe to find your way back here in the future. And as always, thank you all so much for tuning in today, and I will see you in a bit.